Los pueblos indígenas de la Amazonía son dueños de 240 millones de hectáreas y almacenan 140 mil millones de toneladas de carbono, cifra equivalente a las emisiones del planeta durante 140 años. Han demostrado tener una gran capacidad para conservar sus bosques y contribuir al enfriamiento del planeta. La tasa de deforestación en sus territorios es de solo 0.8%, incluso menor a la de las áreas protegidas, que es del 1.1%, y muchísimo menor que la deforestación de la Amazonía como un todo, 2.9%. Los excluidos de los mecanismos red más en la Amazonía. Un pequeño relato sobre por qué no son compensados los territorios indígenas por su verdadera contribución a la mitigación del cambio climático. Al haber conservado sus bosques, los pueblos indígenas han evitado la potencial emisión de 42 gigatoneladas de CO2 a la atmósfera, lo que hubiera acelerado el calentamiento global. La conservación de estos bosques se logra con mucha dificultad por las permanentes amenazas de las cuales son objeto y los continuos incendios, más de 80.000 en toda la Amazonía en 2019. Pero existe una segunda contribución de los bosques amazónicos en la lucha contra el cambio climático, hasta ahora invisibilizada, la captura de CO2. Un estudio de la Universidad de Leeds, en Gran Bretaña, basado en datos de 300 parcelas forestales a lo largo y ancho de la Amazonía, descubrió que los bosques primarios amazónicos capturan o retiran de la atmósfera enormes cantidades de carbono, alrededor de 306 millones de toneladas al año. Sin embargo, esta increíble remoción de millones de toneladas de carbono que realizan los bosques amazónicos no viene siendo computada por los países en su contabilidad ambiental, aquella que mide el CO2 que emite cada país en relación al CO2 que captura. Porque si se hiciera ese cálculo, siempre, según la Universidad de Leeds, 8 de los 9 países amazónicos tendrían un balance positivo. Veamos un ejemplo. Imaginemos en la Amazonía colombiana un territorio. Usaremos como ejemplo a Semari, el resguardo indígena de la cuenca media y alta del río Inirida en el departamento del Guainía. Este territorio, con una extensión de más de 2.2 millones de hectáreas, más grande que países como Israel o El Salvador, tiene millones de toneladas de carbono represadas en sus suelos y en sus bosques. A esto le llamamos el stock de carbono de Semari. Millones de toneladas que saldrían a la atmósfera si las comunidades del resguardo permitieran la deforestación de estos bosques. Pero esos bosques de Semari, además de ser un enorme stock de carbono, remueven de la atmósfera aproximadamente 528 mil toneladas de carbono al año, todos los años. A esto se le llama el flujo. Ambos, el stock y el flujo, hacen que un territorio indígena como Semari contribuya todos los días al enfriamiento del planeta. Al remover, por ejemplo, el CO2 que emiten las industrias del Ruhr en Alemania o los millones de vehículos de China, Estados Unidos o Rusia, por solo nombrar algunos países. Pero nadie parece darse cuenta, ni sus propios gobiernos ni la comunidad internacional, que para que territorios como Semari puedan garantizar ese servicio ambiental, que solo es uno de los 24 servicios ambientales que prestan los bosques tropicales, deben hacer enormes esfuerzos, como impedir la entrada de colonos, hacer frente a las empresas extractivas o al ingreso de madereros ilegales y todo tipo de actividades ilícitas. Y que, para que ello ocurra, deben asegurar la buena gobernanza en su territorio. Una trampita en la forma que funciona Red Más a nivel internacional impide que estos territorios reciban la compensación que les corresponde por el servicio ambiental que proveen. La trampita lleva el nombre de adicionalidad y funciona así. Red más significa reducción de emisiones por deforestación y degradación y es un mecanismo a nivel internacional que quiere premiar a quienes logran reducir su tasa de deforestación. ¿Pero qué pasa con aquellos territorios o comunidades que no pueden reducir su deforestación simplemente porque sus bosques están bien conservados y tienen una mínima o nula deforestación? Nada. En los hechos, quedan excluidos al no tener nada para reducir o mitigar. Parece una broma, pero no lo es. Quedan excluidos del beneficio quienes conservaron sus bosques, porque solo se premia a quienes sí deforestaron y por ello hoy pueden reducir su tasa de deforestación. 
Por eso, algunos hablan del carácter perverso de Red Más. ¿Y cuál será la razón de todo ello? La razón es sencilla y es económica. ¿Por qué pagarle a un pueblo indígena o a un territorio por un servicio ambiental que de todas maneras le seguirán brindando al planeta? De esta forma, la comunidad internacional y especialmente los países que emiten gases de efecto invernadero hacen la vista gorda y solo le pagan a unos pocos, a quienes reducen su tasa de deforestación y dejan de pagar lo que realmente les corresponde por contaminar nuestra casa común, la atmósfera. Esta trampita, o más bien inequidad de parte de los países que más emiten CO2, tiene, sin embargo, patas cortas. Así parece demostrarlo la creciente deforestación de la Amazonía. ¿Qué debe cambiar? Reconocer. El primer paso entonces es reconocer en su verdadera dimensión el servicio ambiental que prestan los bosques amazónicos a la mitigación del cambio climático, y en especial, el que prestan los territorios indígenas con mínima o nula deforestación, tanto en términos de stock como de flujo, y que estos formen parte de la contabilidad ambiental, del balance entre emisiones y captura de las contribuciones determinadas a nivel nacional. Cuantificar. El segundo paso es cuantificar físicamente en toneladas de CO2 esos stocks y ese flujo, es decir, lo que anualmente remueven de la atmósfera los bosques primarios con herramientas sencillas que permitan que sean las mismas comunidades indígenas las que hagan ese cálculo. Valorización financiera. El tercer paso es su valorización financiera a precios de mercado y la posibilidad de negociar a nivel nacional y sobre todo internacional la retribución por el servicio prestado. Crear mecanismos. El último paso es crear los mecanismos para que ese financiamiento fluya a los territorios, fortaleciendo así la gobernanza territorial y la autonomía, la implementación de los planes de vida, el control y vigilancia, las economías indígenas y la defensa de los territorios frente a las permanentes amenazas. Todo lo cual se traducirá en la conservación de sus bosques y garantizará que sigan contribuyendo al enfriamiento del planeta. Uh, really dynamic discussion that's going to take place from with people from around the world focused on uh, uh, free riding uh, the exclusion of indigenous territories from uh, Red Plus, which you'll learn about in the Amazon specifically. It's Human Rights Day, which makes this an auspicious day to um, have such a program. I've been writing about these issues since the 1980s. I was honored to write a book about Chico Mendez and the uh, struggles of rubber tappers, the local community, not indigenous in the Amazon who are fighting for their rights. And one of them said something 30 years ago that's very relevant. Um, he was also part of the Alliance of the Peoples of the Forest, uh, including the, the indigenous peoples of the Amazon. His name was Osmarino um, Amancio Rodriguez. And in my book, I'm just going to read something very quickly. This is in 1987 or so, Osmarino said, uh, at first, the people talking about ecology were only defending the fishes the animals, the forest, and the river. They didn't realize that human beings were in the forest and that these humans were the real ecologists because they couldn't live without the forest and the forest couldn't be saved without them. Um, again, he was speaking as a non-Indigenous longtime forest resident. And these issues are even more valid and, and important now. Uh, we're we're in, uh, approaching the five-year anniversary of the Paris Agreement on climate change, which is built on the 1992 Framework Convention on Climate Change. It includes provisions that still, I just had a session about this yesterday on our webcast, uh, are, they integrate in nominal ways uh, the needs and considerations and value that's produced by indigenous uh, guardianship, but they, it's not really there in a way that's meaningfully uh, improving the lives of the, uh, those in the forests that we all depend on. Uh, this morning, you're going to hear uh, from, again, practitioners, researchers, and activists uh, with Indigenous backgrounds on ways to clarify how we can move to systems, that international systems, and, and finance approaches that can really 
put a value where it's needed on the people who are uh, currently uh, per, uh, guardians uh, through their presence on landscapes. You can see this in the data. It's not some kind of romantic idea. It's in the data, it's in the science. And we'll go forward uh, this morning with a discussion on this. You can hear uh, first from um, Beto Borges, Borges, who is the uh, Forest Trends Director for Communities and Territorial Governance Initiatives at, at, at Forest Trends. And then uh, we're gonna go forward with David Kamowitz, Oliver Phillips and others. It's gonna be a great morning. There's an opportunity for Q&A from you in the audience and uh, for a spirited discussion among those in the panel here today. But let's uh, lead off with uh, Beto. How are you doing? Uh, and I say a little bit about where you are and, and how you came to be doing this work and let's hear from you on this uh, important question. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, um, Andy. Uh, greetings, everyone. Well, I'm Beto Borges. I'm, I'm Brazilian. I've been with Forest Trends for the past uh, 15 years, working in the Amazon for over 35 years. Uh, with the privilege of working directly with indigenous peoples, it's, uh, it's really wonderful to be here. Just wanted to to start uh, for the sake of time. Just go through the points that I, that I want to share with you, um, reflecting on this. Uh, question of um, how inclusive uh, the mechanism of RED has been. Uh, if my dear uh, colleague Julia could just, uh, or do we already see my slides? Uh, there's, I have a couple of slides with some points that I, I wanted to, to share. If you can bring them up, uh, Julia, that would be great. Um, not sure if the slides are up yet. I can't see them from here. Looks like they're coming. Great. Um, <laughs> all right. Um, just minimize my screen here so that I can. Uh, yes, um, you just mentioned, Andy, about um, the, the red mechanisms. And as we know, uh, red really started uh, at, the, at the COP11 in, in Bali with the Bali roadmap that uh, when um, most of what we know as red today started at the time. And um, in, in Cancun at COP 16th in 2010, um, there were uh, important safeguards um, added to, to red, uh, including uh, mention to the UN Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Also the safeguards uh, speak specifically uh, in terms of the respect for the knowledge and rights of indigenous peoples, their full and effective participation, as well as providing mechanisms uh, and incentives for uh, their sustainable livelihoods within RED itself, the mechanism. Uh, however, uh, by 2016, uh, Forest Trends did a report, uh, the geography of RED finance and uh, we uh, noticed that out of the $1.2 billion uh, in red commitments, out of that only $378 uh, million uh, were uh, disbursed, was disbursed to governments, to local governments, specifically in seven countries, tropical countries, uh, but without uh, significant direct benefits to indigenous peoples themselves. So uh, we estimate perhaps just 2% of all the, the funding has uh, even gotten to indigenous peoples. And even then uh, it's questionable uh, how efficient uh, and effective that funding has been because the way in which that it arrived to indigenous communities hasn't really been uh, properly uh, uh, adapted to their cultures and uh, not culturally appropriate, if you will. But a big problem of that, as it has been pointed out in the video, is the fact that RED itself, the mechanism, um, because of the so-called additionality, uh, most of the indigenous territories are excluded because of, they're not considered to be an immediate uh, threat of deforestation, even though that is completely uh, debatable. We don't agree with that in principle. So uh, after all these years with RED, which you know a lot of good intentions and goodwill, a lot of really good people working with it. However, to date, as you can see, uh, the the rates of deforestation continue to be alarming. Uh, RISE just uh, put out really great data uh, recently, 
And uh, between uh, the time that RED started in 2007 to 2018, a total of 32 million hectares of uh, forest was lost in the Amazon, which is about the size of Germany, one of the main uh, funders of uh, climate finance. And out of that, almost 10 million hectares was in Brazil alone between 2007 2019. And uh, this terrible year of 2020, as far as conservation and other things, uh, more than 1 million hectares in Brazil alone uh, in the current uh, uh, administration uh, in Brazil, the government that we have today that is undermining uh, conservation in many ways. Um, and, and yet indigenous peoples uh, continue to resist 240 million hectares in uh, stewards of 240 million hectares of, of forest in the Amazon alone. And the same is true elsewhere in the globe, in Central America, uh, Mexico and Asia and so on in Africa. Deforestation rates, uh, as pointed out by, by, by data, it's uh, very low in indigenous areas, about 0.8%. And that comes to their uh, it, it's a testimony and, and the practice to the fact that uh, indigenous people's contribution to climate conservation is enormous, as you can see, 40 gigatons of carbon dioxide equivalent. Next slide, please. So it's, uh, as we also point out in the video, what we really believe that it's uh, extremely needed are new mechanisms that can really um, uh, respect and reward this um, work of stewardship that indigenous peoples have been doing for, for years at great cost, uh, at, often at the cost of their lives. And uh, we see uh, the, um, the new funding needs to come to what we uh, call the virtual cycle of indigenous territorial governance, wherein uh, funding, new funding streams and new mechanisms um, that would come from both uh, pollu polluters uh, as well as from donors bilaterals for the international corporation um, that would uh, fund the mechanisms that would fund uh, the resources and, and funding directly to indigenous peoples organizations, um, even uh, both at the political level as well as the territorial level organizations and their allies in order to uh, finance their life plans or other uh, territorial management um, instruments, which in turn would provide for strengthening uh, their territorial governance. And here we're talking about uh, political governance in order to strengthen uh, indigenous people's rights to their territories and, the, and how they go about uh, overseeing the integrated management of their forest resources, their economic governance in terms of uh, strengthening uh, and um, um, economic alternatives for the indigenous peoples, making them less vulnerable to the unsound forces of development that are encroaching upon their lands, as well as cultural uh, governance as well, um, which all that really uh, are necessary in order to deliver forest conservation. And from this indigenous stewardship of their, their lands, uh, they continue to deliver climate change mitigation as well as biodiversity conservation, in addition to other ecosystem services, as well as maintaining extremely important cultures. So um, in this cycle, then we see that new ways need to, um, to really value the stewardship of indigenous people. So this direct funding can really continue to promote uh, conservation. And as um, territorial governance is strengthened, so are the rights of indigenous peoples. Thank you so much for being with us. And I really look forward to this panel together. That's an excellent uh, beginning. And those numbers are pretty discouraging. 2% of that finance going to peoples who are actively on the land. And then that additional additionality question, that the idea that, well, that's already saved seems kind of ludicrous. So there's clearly some work to be done. David Kamowitz, uh, Senior Advisor at the Climate and Land Use Alliance, living in Managua, and uh, dug in on these issues for a very long time. Uh, urgency is a top line point that you make. Um, what, what brings the urgency here? Thank you for being here. Thank you very, very much, Andy. And, and, and it's great to be here with all of you. 
Um, I think this is an incredibly important topic. I, I should say up front that I, I'm not opposed to the red programs or to red jurisdictional programs or any red programs. Um, I see this very much as an effort to make this more inclusive and better not to criticize what exists. Um, they gave me five minutes uh, and I'll try to share some of my thoughts in those five minutes with five different points, one of which reflects directly on your question about urgency, Andy. Um, the first point is it's not new, this idea that red programs have perverse incentives because they um, promote this idea of additionality, that something that is already happening, you don't have to pay for because it's happening by itself. I think even though it's not new and it's been said many times over and not just in the case of indigenous peoples, also in the case of countries that have low levels of deforestation like Guyana or Gabon, um, that also have been kind of excluded from these mechanisms. It is worth repeating and it's worth saying that part of that has to do with this myth that's been promoted by part of the conservation community um, that nature doesn't need people. I don't know how many times we've heard on CNN, people need nature, but nature doesn't need people. Um, well, as a matter of fact, nature does need people and this is a very good case of it if it weren't for the indigenous people in these areas they would have the deforestation rates of the areas outside these territories and it's the presence of these people that's kept this deforestation low so it's important to say nature does need people and it's important to repeat this idea that we need to support not only avoiding deforestation, um, but also making sure that the areas that are reasonably well conserved um, remain in, in good condition and, and well supported. A second point I'd like to make is that for mostly practical reasons, these programs have tended to focus on carbon emissions and carbon sinks that have to do with land use change. So that's deforestation or reforestation. Why have they done that? They've done that for practical reasons, largely because that's the easiest thing to track from a satellite. Um, but it's just as important in terms of the climate, how much carbon is being captured and how much carbon is being emitted from areas that don't have land use change. So those are forests that are continuing to capture um, carbon, like these many of these forests in the indigenous territories we're talking about, or forests that are being degraded. There is really no conceptual reason not to include those sinks and those um, emissions. It's just a practical issue, but it's a practical issue that has very strong implications for in practical terms as we've seen because in this case we have all of these forests that are capturing all of this carbon and that's not even being considered because there's no land use change involved they are in fact providing an actual service of additional carbon being captured each year the third thing i want to focus on is and and this may be a little bit of a disagreement with the um, report itself. And it relates to your question, Andy, of urgency. Um, and that is one of the reasons these indigenous territories have been largely ignored in the discussion is the belief that there's no problem. Why solve a problem that doesn't exist? Um, why pay people for areas that are not threatened? Um, and that's based in this idea that these are stable forests. Um, and it's based on a methodology of what's called reference scenarios and a methodology to um, investigate or to measure how much of a risk of a forest is in based on how much deforestation it's had in the past. 
The reality, unfortunately, is that many of these forests are very, very much increasingly at risk. Um, they're at risk from livestock, they're at risk from drug traffickers, they're at risk from oil palm, they're at risk from mining, they're at risk from um, logging. And these things are not being adequately captured. They're not being adequately captured in part because we're looking at what happened the last 20 years, not so much what's happening in the, right now or the last couple of years. And we're certainly not looking at what the threats are likely to be for the next four or five years. They're also not being caught because a lot of the problem is on the degradation side, not just the deforestation side. So these territories do have right now often low um, deforestation rates, but they're increasingly being damaged by fires from next door. They're increasingly being damaged by logging, which de seriously degrades and creates emissions, but isn't deforestation. So the threats are increasing very, very rapidly, in surprisingly rapidly. And that is what brings us to the urgency of solving this problem rather than just assuming that these are stable forests that are going to remain stable. The fourth point I want to make is, relates to the conceptual framework that's used in this whole context, which is a mistaken conceptual framework of payment for environmental services. Generally speaking, the whole theory of payment for environmental services was designed with the idea that you have a landowner that that landowner has to decide, do I want to have my land as a forest or do I want to put it into some other use like a cattle ranch or cropping or, or something else? If they decide to put it into the forest, then that has a cost for them. That what economists call an opportunity cost. Somebody has to pay them for the cost that they incur by their decision not to put this into forest, uh, not to put this into cattle but to actually keep as a, as a forest. But that's not the situation of these indigenous territories. They are not landowners who are deciding whether to put their um, land into forests or to put it into cattle or into crops. They are landowners who are being attacked, invaded, encroached upon by outside external groups. Um, and what they need is a system of payments that allows them to strengthen their capacity to defend themselves from all of these external groups. It's a very different conceptual framework. And finally, let me just say that even though we're discussing the Amazon today, that this does not only apply to the Amazon in Latin America, the Amazon is about two thirds of this story in Latin America in terms of indigenous peoples, maybe a half of the story if we include non-indigenous peoples as well, but there are also very important areas in the Pacific of Colombia and Mesoamerica and other parts of Latin America where this is a major problem. Thank you very much. Thank you, David. That was incredibly valuable, especially that idea that um, it really has to be a qualitative. The, the work is not simply yes forest, no forest. It's quality of forest, quality of carbon, quality of uh, outcomes, uh, really important points. And that gets to the role of science. Uh, and this is where uh, Oliver Phillips, professor of tropical ecology at Leeds University the School of Geography comes in. I'm going to just show you one. This is like a 10 second clip. It's not even 10 seconds. And some people out there have probably seen it already. But this shows you, this is the Xingu Reserve in Brazil. And it shows you over time, just pretty vividly, what we're talking about. Look at the indigenous territory and look at the area outside of that territory. I just thought it was worth sticking that in briefly. So Oliver, can you brief uh, the audience on uh, your thinking as we uh, dig in on this issue and how to make things better. Yeah, th thanks, Andy, uh, and thanks everyone for the opportunity to, to uh, share a bit of our work. Um, uh, Julia, if you could bring out some slides, that, that's probably the best place to start, and I can I can talk through those if that's possible. Um, fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, so I thought we should start, actually, this, this is not, not our research. The, these are really critical facts. Um, this, this kind of broadening out you know, the indigenous people's story is incredibly important, but it intersects, of course, with, with equally large and important issues. And, and when we're talking about 
intact, structurally intact or mature forest in the Amazon, there's all sorts of benefits which flow from them. And we, I think we should just all take a moment just to reflect on that. Um, so first of all, where I'm sitting now, um, it's, it's a dull winter's day in the UK, but if I get to my woodlands, which are beautiful here, I might find 10 species in a hectare, maybe five in an acre. And that's a level of diversity that, that we live in the temperate zone. Amazonia in one hectare has six times the tree species as a whole of the United Kingdom. So this, this for me is an extraordinary fact. And the extent to which indigenous peoples are guardians of this biodiversity is a service that they provide to the whole world, which we need to recognize. Uh, secondly, in terms of carbon, Amazonia stores more than 100 billion tons of carbon. So this is many years of our emissions sitting there still, luckily, in the soils, but particularly in the trees. And again, this is largely a service provided by the mature forest. The river flows regulated. The people downstream depend on the forest and the vegetation upstream to ensure the floods are not too severe. And in the dry season, the waters are still flowing. Uh, this is before we even talk about the direct impacts on global climate via energy mm -hmm. exchange and so on, which uh, big forest regions like the Amazon, uh, the Amazon really are critically important. And then, um, Para as pessoas que estão tá, tá no Brasil, uh, people in, in Argentina, wherever you are, if you're in southern South America, a lot of the rain in these really big agricultural zones and also central Brazil too, comes from the Amazon. Uh, to the extent the forests are damaged, so uh, we have a colleague I know speaking from Ecuador in Amazon, the, the trees in his part of the world, when they evapotranspire water, that water you can see ends up falling in Bolivia, Argentina, Brazil, and it feeds the soybeans uh, and the cattle and the sugar cane and everything else which industrial societies there and beyond are using. So the Amazon provides all these fantastic services. Um, and and the, I'll talk a little bit about our work in, in a minute. It's really just a small part of the story. So we knew all these things. We also knew, of course, by the way, that keeping forest intact stops pandemics so you know we kind of always knew this but this year this is a really important point to make again the extent to which degradation deforestation and edges can be reduced we are reducing the chances of every single one of us having our lives transformed um, and, and largely you know not for the better so uh, we need to really really value forests and this is we're talking particularly about structurally intact forests. That's, these are the most valuable systems on earth. Uh, next slide, please, Julia. Okay, so all of that is true, um, but that what is, is underappreciated to an extent is also that the mature forests, so these are forests we think of as being maybe at some kind of equilibrium, are actually not. So they are providing a carbon sink right now. So they're taking up more CO2 from the atmosphere than they are emitting. And um, it's actually really hard to measure this. I'm gonna show you with the next slide how we do it and colleagues do it. It's, it's tough work and you need to measure a lot of trees over a lot of time and be persistent and, and, um, and work with lots of people. And the reason, why, the reason why it's so hard is actually the effect is very small on a per hectare scale. It's just a few hundred kilos of carbon every year, which is not very much in a 300 ton Amazon forest. But because the areas of mature forest are still very large, it scales up to a really big number. So the map on the left, um, just to try and explain to you there, those green bars represent the sink, the net sink into intact forests uh, that's provided. And this is in millions of tons of carbon, yeah. So in Brazil, for example, we've estimated over 200 millions of tons of carbon going in to mature Amazon forest each year. On the red, you have the net land use change emissions and on the black fossil fuel emissions. And this is, this is a view, uh, this is an average through the late 20th century, early 21st century. So you can see indeed that in almost all South American forested countries, we estimate the sink into the mature forest is greater than the net emissions from fossil fuel and land use change combined. Okay, so these scale up to be really big numbers, but this depends on keeping these forests uh, substantially 
undisturbed. Uh, e even in Ecuador, which is a big uh, petroleum producing country and has a relatively high rate of fossil fuel emissions per capita for a South American country, the sink into the forests above uh, Yasuni in the region south of there are more important than the source from fossil fuels so far. So another way of looking at this, of course, these countries are providing a service uh, not just to the world, but also they should be being used in a national argument to say we are contributing. So Peru, Colombia, Brazil, uh, Bolivia, Ecuador, uh, Venezuela, Suriname, Guyana, and even French Guyana, though that's kind of questionable whether it's Europe or South America, these are all actually making a huge difference to their national emissions. And they should be being used um, at the international level in the, the Paris Accord of submissions that they're developing. And I think it's, it's just, a, it's, it's more than a shame, it's a crime that they're not. Um, and, and one of the topics we can talk about today is why they're not, but they really should be. These are really massive fluxes. Uh, next slide, please. So th this is my last slide. I just wanted to share with you just a bit to try and explain you know, how we learn this stuff um, in one picture. And I wanted just to, to really go to a really, really big tree in Colombia. This is a cyber pentandra, um, which is uh, the species is widespread in South America. It's very often a sacred tree for indigenous peoples in the Amazon. Uh, typically it has these huge buttress roots, right? So you can see the folks on the left, there's a ladder down the bottom. That's already a four meter ladder. They've climbed up lianas and stranglers to get 10 meters up above the roots to the cylindrical part of the stem. And that's where on the right, uh, three, three guys there are measuring it. They're 10 meters up above the ground um, and uh, have, have reasonable safety equipment, but, but you know, not that much. And you have to measure at a cylindrical point in order to know the diameter. And then knowing that and the species and the height, you can estimate the biomass. But to get the change from one period to another, you have to go back to exactly the same point of measurement on the tree. So you have to be really, really careful about doing this. You can't just estimate it by eye. Uh, it's, as I wrote here, it requires really precise measurement, requires tremendous skills that, that I don't have, and actually more courage than I have. When I try to do this, I just, I just tremble and I can't, I can't get above about five meters. So it's actually really tough work. Um, and, and I really, when I talk about this, I really want to kind of salute the efforts of colleagues uh, really right across South America at all levels, and, 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 but especially those who are doing what we call the, um, some people might call the more basic physical work, because actually it's incredibly tough and challenging. Uh, one of the things I would just like to just to, to finish with is a plug just for the value of this work and for valuing the skills of people who are, to a greater or lesser extent, still forest-based. We still need these people uh, as in a global scientific sense, and we need them in ways which people often deny. So we can't actually measure what's happening with inside these forests from satellites. Space just doesn't cut it. You can spend, and, and people do, billions of dollars on putting eyes in the sky. And they're incredibly powerful for looking at deforestation, but they can't measure the subtle changes happening within forests. And for that, you really need great skill and you need a lot of really dedicated people on the ground. Um, I'll, I'll end it there. We can come back to this later. Fantastic. Thank you, Oliver. Boy, that brings to mind several things. One important observation very briefly is that what you said is that this work illustrates that the value of these intact forests is not just like to Europe or North America or the, the northern part of the world that cares about biodiversity, but regionally, the, the weather impacts, hydrological impacts uh, are a significant benefit to countries uh, all around the Amazon and these adjacent areas. And also that point you made about the grunt work of science on the ground uh, recalls the work of Pam McElwee at Rutgers, who's been looking at how to value, um, that the, how to have indigenous partnership in the science. There's probably great opportunities there to see who's tending to those tree uh, exactly. analyses and the like. Um, that was great. And uh, now uh, we move to uh, Carmen Joss, who's coordinating um, work uh, in a four country part of the Amazon, uh, looking at uh, biomass change and uh, what, what its implications are for uh, measurement and, and in the context of these agreements and also for the peoples of the forest. 
thank you for being part of this, Carmen. Thank you very much. And you're in uh, you're in Quito. Yes, I am in Quito, Ecuador. Great. Yes. Um, good morning to everyone, or good afternoon, wherever you are. Um, thank you, Andrew, and thank you, um, Beto, for the invitation to form part of this super interesting panel uh, and very important discussion. Um, I would like to also ask for my uh, slides, Julia, if it's possible. Um, and it, I, I will be very brief um, talking about some um, facts or some um, you know, science or scientific uh, research results that we uh, just public, uh, published um, um, in the context of, of two uh, projects or, or initiatives that we are part of. When I say we is um, Ecociencia, I'm uh, the director of Ecociencia, the member in Ecuador uh, of the RISC, the Red Amazonica de Información Socioambiental Georeferenciada. And, and as this network, we work um, uh, the last uh, couple of years together with the Woodsall Research uh, Center, um, joining in an effort to measure exactly what uh, David especially was talking about, the degradation part of uh, the red uh, plus, right? Uh, red is reduction of emissions from deforestation and degradation. But indeed, degradation has uh, had, uh, you know, practical um, uh, difficulties in, in terms of monitoring degradation, forest degradation. Um, but so starting with the results of this uh, publication that came out at the beginning of this year, um, first we can have a look here at uh, the above ground carbon uh, stocks, right? How they were distributed um, in the forest, uh, Amazonian forest in 2003. So 43% is distributed in what we called other land, which is not indigenous territories, uh, nor uh, natural protected areas. 33% uh, was uh, uh, stored in indigenous territories and 24% in, in protected areas. When we looked at the net losses, right? And this uh, measurement comes from uh, loss, total loss, you know, through uh, not only deforestation, but this is looking at the change in um, density of uh, biomass in the forests. And from there, the carbon loss is calculated. So the net loss that we are talking about here is um, loss and um, gain. So loss plus gain or losses plus gains. And from that uh, total carbon loss uh, throughout the Amazon forest, 90% of that amount was lost in which, uh, what we call dollar land, while only 7% was lost uh, in, from uh, natural protected areas and 3% from indigenous territories. So, and when we looked exactly or more um, specifically to the net uh, balance, so to speak, in indigenous territories, um, taking into account carbon losses from deforestation and from degradation, the balance comes to almost a net zero, okay? while of course in these other lands outside the protected areas and indigenous territories we are lost, losing uh, actually uh, the balance is negative anyways uh, the next slide please and and to talk about deforestation versus degradation uh, we did also this uh, analysis um, on these different units of uh, land management or land stewardship. 
Okay, so in the first um, part of the slide here on, on the uh, upper left, uh, we are looking at what is the dynamic over this period of almost 13 years, uh, yes, 13 years between 2003 and 2016. What was the dynamics of this change uh, in terms of uh, loss, okay, of above ground carbon within indigenous territories? So upper left is indigenous territories. And what we can see here is that uh, one thing, of course, the loss is smaller than, a lot smaller than in other lands, for instance, but most of it is owed to degradation, which is the lighter uh, red color, okay? And only about 18% of the loss was due to deforestation. So the remainder of the loss in this type of uh, uh, you know, indigenous territories uh, was uh, due to degradation, mainly. A similar pattern we found in, in protected nat natural areas. And in other land, it is completely different. When you look at what was the curve in other lands, what you can see is that most of the uh, loss uh, of biomass and therefore emissions of carbon and so forth was due to deforestation. Now, when we look at the uh, lower right um, graphic, uh, we can see that when we, for the whole Amazon, we look into what was the dynamic. Uh, yes, indeed, still most of the loss of biomass and therefore emissions again, is due to deforestation, but it's almost 47% that is due to degradation. So this is something that is going on and therefore I, I uh, want to follow on uh, several of David, uh, of the points that David came up with, uh, did just a moment ago. Uh, because a, from what we are seeing in most of the countries are reporting, which is uh, deforestation, you know, and, and sometimes in several of our countries, uh, we have been able to show a reduction in deforestation in relation to the reference um, uh, time, okay? And therefore we are getting uh, the, the red uh, plus um, uh, funds. Uh, because we are uh, you know, achieving some of, of these um, uh, goals in reduction, but nobody's looking yet at degradation. And uh, the next slide, please. So again, when, again, uh, if we look at uh, deforestation and I will uh, go through this very quickly, and this is uh, published in our very recently launched uh, Atlas uh, of the Amazon Under Pressure 2020, just this week as RISE, we launched it. So again, forest cover uh, in indigenous territories, if we add uh, what is indigenous territories and the overlap of indigenous territories and protected areas, we can see that 33% of forest is in indigenous territory. Uh, in the Amazon. And again, deforestation is showing uh, that a very small part in, is uh, occurring within IT. But definitely, uh, and that problem uh, within IT uh, is also a, or, or is degradation because as David was saying, uh, we can see that uh, degradation is uh, occurring in these lands, and uh, that has a lot of um, consequences. It's not about uh, only the loss of, of uh, you know, trees, but, but uh, many changes in, in ecological processes and in biodiversity, uh, of course, many losses. And the next uh, slide, please. And here again, uh, I just wanted to show uh, what has been, in terms of deforestation, the trend 
within protected areas here on the upper left. Uh, in, as I said, protected areas, we, uh, after um, reaching a, a lower point uh, in the 2010, 2012 years, uh, from then on, uh, the deforestation started to rise again. And we have seen, um, you know, a, a deep uh, rise or, or rather a continuous uh, rise uh, from 2015 to 2018, which is the last uh, year in, in this report. And in the upper right, we can see what is going on in terms of deforestation in indigenous territory in, in the Amazon. So it is also um, ri raising, rising um, again and rising uh, steadily from 2016 on. And we think that uh, when we look at, uh, or we will look at 2019 and 2020, uh, we will have uh, pretty much the, the same result uh, that uh, the, the rise um, uh, is, is um, continuous in, in deforestation. But as I said, degradation is also an important uh, point. And uh, I wanted to uh, basically say that um, from what we have seen, uh, in our analysis of the atlas that I mentioned, of course, all the indigenous territories have a lot of um, a, a lot of uh, infrastructure uh, and extractive industries are uh, overlapping on those territories. And for sure, that is an important part of the degradation that can be seen in those territories. Uh, but Further, uh, the problem is uh, from what we are starting also to uh, understand and to uh, have data for is the uh, illegal activities. And I want to mention that and, and stress that out uh, very um, uh, importantly because, um, you know, from illegal mining, um, illegal logging, um, illegal crops. Um, basically, when the indigenous territories um, have that kind of invasion, so to speak, um, it is very hard for them to fight as they have been able so far over the years to fight against um, oil companies or mining companies. Um, in the end, at least those legal activities or permitted activities by the countries, they need to um, adopt certain standards. While illegal activities led, uh, you know, they, of course, because of their nature, uh, they don't adopt any standard. And for any, uh, any country, not, not to speak about uh, indigenous peoples, is really hard to fight that um, that that problem. Uh, so the governance, the the think of or the importance of of uh, funding for strengthening the governance uh, of indigenous peoples in all the aspects that uh, Beto showed uh, at the beginning of the panel. Um, it's absolutely important, but uh, I think we need to stress also the importance of uh, really having uh, countries um, understand the, the, the threat, the tremendous threat that uh, these illegal activities encroaching and encroaching far deeper into uh, indigenous territories uh, can, are making now and can uh, continue making into the future. So I would like to stop there and thank you. Muchas gracias. That's a fascinating and an important addition. Uh, the degradation issue and the other challenges within indigenous lands are clearly one of the key issues to track forward going forward. And governance, governance, governance <laughs> matters so much in, in all of these circumstances. That integration of data with decision making 
the data from what Oliver was talking about and the governance is, uh, these are all frontiers to work on. Juan Carlos uh, Hintiach, who's a technical advisor for COICA, the coordinating group of indigenous organizations of the Amazon River Basin. Uh, buenos dias, it's great to have you uh, here. Uh, what are your reflections on what you've heard so far and where do we go? Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Beto, and hello to everyone. Um, it's uh, here, good, good morning and good afternoon and good night in different parts of the world. Uh, thank you for this uh, time and opportunity to express uh, some work or some experience what uh, my organization, COICA, is an umbrella indigenous organization from the Amazon Basin. Uh, we are distributed in nine uh, regional organizations in the nine countries where is the Amazon Basin. Uh, first of all, we need to mention as a principle for us that uh, indigenous organizations are quite organized. We have our own governments and we have our own structure. But from the first uh, ground, second ground, uh, international, Lankoica also uh, brings all the demands for the indigenous voices uh, plans of lives, strategic plans from the ground, from different nine indigenous organizations in the nine countries. Saying this, uh, uh, COICA is almost, uh, uh, every four years we have a new uh, time to, in democratic election time to change government. So from 2018, there's a new vision, a new government right now running COICA. So uh, uh, going to the point uh, about the experience with the red, red please, indigenous organizations like COICA do a lot of effort to travel and monitoring the international system, the international arena. That is why from in the, we are following the platforms of the CBD convention. We are following platforms of the UNFCCC in the international partnerships with other regions around the world. In the seven regions distributed in the in, under the United Nations language, holding with two contexts: indigenous people and local communities. So, saying this, uh, the COP to uh, 17, as everybody knows here, and the speakers were mentioning, and the, there was a, a, a huge, big problem for indigenous people and local community because I am one of the focal points who are following the international language, international negotiations on behalf of COICA. They were presenting this initiative about red or red plus. This was a, like a boom, but that was a, a specific problem for us. I mean, we are talking about social consents, but no so only social consents. We were saying, what about indigenous concerns, but about local community concerns and also Afro-descendant concerns. So that started to COICA and other partners uh, to work together and analyze how is going to go this dynamic. And this is going to be a huge problem. One, again, to say that the big principle for us is to uh, consult between us, COICA, emergency, create a consultation between the leaders and the Amazon Basin, and then the leaders and the COICA, uh, we decide to have another partnership, a big assembly and discuss, uh, and discuss about uh, Red Plus and perspective, <coughs> ambition and propositions of indigenous organizations. Saying this in 2012, we decide to work and go forward to try to analyze these perspectives. So this was a very big, uh, huge challenge uh, and then some uh, supporters like NORAD and some partnership like RISE and, and WWR uh, and Wilhorst Centers, we get together. And this is one point I want to remark. We get together and analyze and propose and the least indigenous people how it's going to be affected in our territories. We were having a huge, a huge problem in our own homes, in our own ecosystem, in our own territories. So the point, the, the first point is that we decide to uh, create our initiative from our own initiatives from the indigenous organizations. That, that's why we create RIA, what is Red Indigenous from the Amazon Basin. 
in consensus, in consultations, free, pure, informed consent. So this initiative, we need to try to complement, to analyze with Red Plus Convention, because for some governments, only they were the, the key actors, but they were not paying attention to indigenous people. Yes, we have rights, but we have rights and we are stakeholders, we, we write, but sometimes, like in Ecuador, we are recognized collective rights. In Ecuador is recognizing the natural rights, but we need to put this in the table. That is why the next second stop, we need to analyze, we were analyzing how we is going to work for us the Red Plus Convention. So for COICA and Red Indigenous from Amazon, we're trying to match. And then some government was trying to listen that they were not going to support our propositions. But that was the idea from the COICA and the leaders to create the round table, the multidisciplinary round table in each country, in the nine countries, but Ecuador, Peru, Colombia, they were working, they were listening, but many of these world tables failed for many reasons. But one of the big reasons is that the government's initiatives from the government or some other partners, they were not going respecting the principles of indigenous people. What is free, pure, for consent, uh, particip participation, uh, equality with transparency, and all the information has to be and the table for the leaders, for the NGOs, for the university. And that's why we are creating these processes. And successful, yes, some parts it was in Peru. In Peru, the, some government were given the chance to adapt it and to try to match with the red uh, conventional and the red indigenous for Amazon was working there. And then right now in Ecuador, also we are working, we have a working table and multi multidisciplinary and we are trying to implement. Yes, we are implementing. So we are in the second phase, second phase uh, uh, right now. And the, and the, the first, first point uh, was consultation, developing the initiative of Red Indigenous from the Amazon. Right now we are in the second uh, proposition that we present in the last COP in, in Madrid, uh, the Red Indigenous on the Amazon. But this second option has to realize that these incentives has to go on the ground. Many of these uh, uh, resources flowing globally in this big uh, space, we need to coordinate with partners and the strategic alliance to see going directly on the ground. COICA is working right now with some specific initiatives and we are working, uh, supporting uh, restoration initiatives in Ecuador, and we are going to go in, in, in Colombia and, 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 and Bolivia and, and other regions. But the dynamics are very uh, huge, uh, controversial, because sometimes we have very political problems with geodynamic in the region. As you know, in Brazil, it's complicated to work also with some governments are changing the visions, but Right now, we looked with hope. Uh, we have uh, some hopes that maybe with this new dynamics, uh, how is going to come in the government of the United States uh, again to support the Accord of Paris. Coica is preparing and receiving all the ideas with the partners and go forward. So uh, saying this, and I would like to memorize and uh, remember the leaders that we're working with the initiative, Red Indigenous from the Amazon is still alive. We are working with the Red Indigenous Amazon right now. It's implementing in Peru with some cases in, in some reserves and in some indigenous territories, Camaracaire, you were mentioned in Colombia, but that is part of the process, part of the process how we were working uh, because we did free, pure, informed consent. Otherwise, if we don't do this, we have to, the right to say yes and the right to say no. Otherwise, nobody is going to listen to our voices and proposals, and also they need to respect how we are organized and how we are working in our own 
countries in our own territory. Mm -hmm. And the vision is to, to work with all territories and most maybe 200 million hectares. Uh, that is the ambition. But uh, still, we are fighting with our rights. We still we are fighting uh, for the these uh, resources that they are not going to the ground. Uh, still, we are going to claim the international right. There are no respect in the, the right. They are criminalization. They are persecuting indigenous leaders. They are killing indigenous leaders daily because only for say we need to defend. I want to protect my land. I want to protect my my water. And then this is a criminalization. So I, I uh, invite to the international cooperation. I invite to uh, international partners uh, like you, you and the other friends that we are still uh, doing our effort, organizing with very well structured. Every time we are working that in the structure, I mean, it's a lot of challenges, yes. But if we work together, we we need to commemorate and remember all the time that every day as the human rights day, every day we need to remember for the mother air, every day we need to remember how much forest we are losing, how much forest we are, uh, we need to protect. But the principle of this is about life, human beings life. Mm -hmm. We are living there, in the rainforest, we are watching there, we are monitoring ourselves and we are protecting this like, a, like everybody from my brothers and sisters are doing there. Thank you very much. And Thank you very much. That was a very powerful summation of a critical part of the challenge, which is really integrating the indigenous communities into the process, the decision-making, the formal structures of the agreements is a way to um, make more progress. So um, Michael Jenkins, I would love it if you we, you could uh, come in and reflect a bit before we get to some of the great, there's really some really good questions. I can go a little beyond the uh, turn of the half hour myself. I don't know who else can stay on, but it'd be great if we can have a good solid discussion of some of the questions coming in. Um, yeah, Michael great, Jenkins, great and well be. Yours. Yeah, I'll and, be, and I'll I'm be. sorry to say Victoria Tauli Corpus, who had planned to be with us from the Philippines is, um, there's been some technical issues. So anyway, Michael. Yeah, no, so I'll be very short. And, and the idea is just to sort of reiterate um, and reflect on some of the, the comments we've heard. And I first want to thank the panelists um, and you, Andrew, for, for, um, for spending this time with us and, and helping us work through some of these issues. And I, like Wonka was saying at the end, I think we human rights should be, we should have a human rights day every day, right? And I think that's a that's a very powerful way to think about this. I, I wanted to start by just a couple of points. One is in the in the video, they started with, you know, point number one is reconocer. And so it's really recognizing the incredible role that indigenous pe peoples play in terms of forest conservation globally and in the tropics. We at Forest Trends with some colleagues at, at RRI also have done, a, did a series of reports early on years ago that documented that over a quarter of the world's tropical forests were owned and managed by indigenous peoples. Um, so they're they're really central in this challenge of thinking about uh, about deforestation. And what what's important about these forests, of course, when we think about climate and other issues, I think Oliver really touched on a couple of very important points about intact forests. Right. So the point the 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 premise that we are putting forward here is that we're missing a big part of the equation when we think about forests and climate and the role that indigenous peoples play in those intact forests that are not under threat immediately. Um, and what he was saying, of course, reminding us of the relationship between the degradation of these forests and pandemics that obviously we are all living through today and we will be living through in the future. And intact forests are the one of the best ways to avoid those crossovers and those future pandemics. And, and even when you think about balance sheets for countries and regions, the, the critical role that intact forests play in, in terms of um, absorbing stocks and, and, and as sinks for the, the uh, emissions that come out of other sectors of those countries in those regions. So just remembering that 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 should be central in our thinking when we are 
when we continue to, to work on these issues. And as Beto said in his opening remarks and some research that we did, we estimate that at most 2% of the funding that goes to forest and climate actually goes to any in any form or shape to supporting indigenous peoples. And in most cases, not very effectively when it, when it arrives there anyway. So, so we have this huge challenge in front of us um, to think about that. And the mechanisms and the instruments that, that we create in places like Geneva and, and um, you know, are, really, are really in many times, not only ineffective, but inappropriate when you think about the, the realities and the cultural settings of some of the, the, the communities that are in these uh, intact areas. Um, so it leads me to frankly, the, 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 what we wanna get into is, is like, how do we make these changes? What are the changes that we need, we need to make? Uh, Wanka was also talking about the role that Quika has been trying to play in kind of the international fora and, and the COPs and all of those, uh, those events that we've been, we've been doing. And, and it's frankly been relatively token uh, presence. And by, you know, it just is not, the way we design these things are not the way that communities, indigenous communities would, would design them. Um, Wanka was talking about the the kind of the uh, the values that they have around consultation processes, those have not. We've we've the boxes that we've designed have not been able to accommodate the realities uh, and the values of, of of community. So I think it's a real rethink. I think we we need to think in terms of forests. We need to be able to talk about issues like sinks and stocks and degradation as critical parts of this when we engage with. Uh, the, the, the stewards of those intact forests, the indigenous and local communities, we need to really rethink the way we value their experience, their knowledge and their culture. Um, and this is where I think a number of us have been thinking that there needs to be a new kind of approach, right? There needs to be a new instrument like RED, but one that is really designed and, um, uh, and structured in a way that it, it, it is inclusive to the, the needs and the values that these communities bring us. So, so I think that's, you know, we're in an, an incredibly important moment, I think, right now, globally, when we think about forests and climate and communities. And I think we have to deliver that message very strongly and clearly to, uh, to our new government here in the United States, to uh, the, the COP process, to all of these processes that we need different approaches if we are going to effectively engage with the communities that are the primary stewards of these forests that we care about. I think about them a little bit like the way we are now talking about uh, healthcare workers around the world as these are the first responders. These are the folks that need to get the most support. Uh, we need to do that when we, we, need to, we need to take that model and think about the indigenous communities and peoples as first responders really to the, the, uh, the challenge of deforestation. We need, to, we need to find ways that are consistent with their life plans, their cultural approaches to strengthen their capacity and their governance. Um, so I'm just gonna turn that over to you, Andrew, and because I think we have a lot of great questions we wanna get to. We do, and that, that point is so uh, resonant for me because I've been running sessions on COVID-19 and on the um, challenge of building an economy that values caregivers. It's the care economy. If people Google for care economy, at least in the United States, we do not do a good job of valuing those un, under, like a woman caring for someone at home is not paid, compensated, or that value is lost. And this is exactly a counterpart of that at the global scale in terms of resources that we all care about, but we're not valuing those parts of the dynamics that help keep it going. Some wonderful questions have come in. Uh, I'm going to start with a very simple one that seems very uh, resonant to me and, and uh, valuable. I'll even post it here. Hopefully you can see my screen. Morrison Mast asks, for early career conservationists, business people in the global north who want to contribute professionally to inclusion of indigenous peoples in carbon markets, what's the most impactful way to get involved? Where is the greatest need for human capital? How do you get this going? That's just, that seems... I should do a whole session of my show on that one question. Uh, and I don't know who would like to dive in. Maybe David, uh, 
uh, you could offer a quick thought or whoever, just raise your hand if you want to get, get to it. A, a quick thought is that they should go into communications. They should follow Andy Revkin <laughs> um, and get these messages out. Thanks. Anything else come to mind? A quick, a quick reaction to what, what would a young uh, early career conservationist or business person do to where, what's the place to work on here? Where's the, where's the toolkit? Uh, well, I will do a, you know, I'll pledge to do a session on that for, for and with Forest Trends on my webcast because I can pull together some people who represent that early career community. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Morrison. Uh, there are other questions uh, that are more technical in nature and really important. Steve Schwartzman asked a few. Um, and I think Beto, you said that Chris or someone here could, what would be great is if someone could summarize his question in a general way and then offer a response. Steve, I've known since my days in the Amazon 1989. Same here. Um, Steve is referring to the benefits of, um, uh, of uh, jurisdictional red programs. Um, and uh, I think they are, they are, there have been uh, good developments there. And um, however, um, you know, Steve, good friend as well. We've known each other for many years working in the Amazon, Brazilian Amazon. Uh, our experience, my experience in particular, uh, referring to two um, of the RIM, uh, Red Early Movers Program uh, in Brazil, especially the one in Acre that has supported the Acre, the CISA system in Acre. Uh, forest trends. I've been directly involved in the indigenous soup program of CISA, which is the jurisdictional program in the state of Acre in Brazil. Uh, really great work uh, that was done um, there. However, as of recent, um, especially in the new government, the gains that uh, we were able to achieve under CISA have not been able to be maintained because of uh, the dynamics of deforestation and perhaps the political will is not there as it used to be so much, uh, uh, despite of the challenges. The fact is, even before uh, when uh, CISA was more robust, uh, the payments that came through uh, RAM and other programs, even though there was some um, funds directed to indigenous communities, I think out of 18 million, if I'm 18 million, I, I believe, uh, 3 million actually, um, um, benefited some indigenous groups throughout the state of Acre. There we're talking about, um, um, you know, 4 million hectares uh, more or less in the hands of indigenous peoples. But the way in which uh, the funds were disbursed, uh, we considered that it was not really culturally appropriate because indigenous people, they had to write proposals to receive those funds. Mm. Um, there was one good part of it that was uh, working with ag indigenous agroforesters but the point that we're trying to make here is the fact that um, when you look uh, at it, um, uh, CISA, uh, even though it's not running as well nowadays, it's, it's a minute example of what really needs to take place. The enormous amount of climate finance, even though that it's not up to the commitment that was first made, uh, it's really getting stuck in government bureaucracies that uh, are, have proven to be inefficient and sometimes corrupt. You know, we have to, to <laughs> that's a reality, unfortunately. We're not, for instance, it's not against red, it's not against jurisdictional red, it's not against, uh, against uh, pilot uh, project-based red. I think there is a place for all of it as long as uh, the safeguards from Cancun get, get uh, uh, taken seriously. They need to be participatory and the direct ben and directly benefits indigenous peoples. That's not really happening in Acre so much is happening even less in Mato Grosso. So the facts are there. So uh, Steve, if you have the concrete data as much uh, in terms of what indigenous peoples have benefit in numbers, I would be lovely. I it would be lovely to know, maybe we can work on, on an article together. We'd be happy to continue to work with EDF and others. So we're just uh, trying to get the word out on the need to increase direct financing to indigenous peoples. Thank you. Yeah, Steve made a follow-up point about um, the CDM and th this backlog of credits that are marginal, if, if at all, and how that could end up, um, we could end up with a situation where the markets are flooded with, um, as he says, zero environmental quality credits. Uh, again, we maybe can leave some of those questions for a, f for a future broadcast, or as you said, some collaborations. 
there's a question that came in from um, Philip Rothrock that's worth putting in the floor. This is for Carmen mainly. Uh, Carmen, he says, thank you for your presentations. It's really about soy, uh, you know, in sort of a macroeconomic look at how you can reduce pressure on the Amazon. As some previous research has tied the industry agreement in the soy sector as a factor reducing some of the deforestation in the Amazon, uh, the value is diminished given leakage, et cetera. Uh, did your research see any connection with reductions in areas managed by others? I don't know if there's some question. Um, I, I think I cannot unfortunately respond to that question because we haven't done the, the detail, um, but, you know, look into the data we have. Uh, uh, in terms of deforestation, for instance, where was it occurring while the soy moratorium was um, active? Uh, you know, whether it, it increased in other places uh, close to those areas of, of soy, especially in Brazil, because it was in Brazil, the country which did that moratorium. Um, so I, I am sorry, but I'm not sure I can answer yeah. Uh, specifically that question. Okay, I might, I might build a slightly broader question around that for the panel generally. Um, Dan Nebstad and others have over the years done pretty interesting work showing that agricultural intensification in areas where you can do that, knowing the inputs and the outputs and are reliably can reduce pressure on deforestation. This seems to be a huge potential maybe in a post Bolsonaro Brazil, for example, of building that part of the industry, even in relationship with the indigenous community support as a way to cut some of the pressure on the Amazon. Is this being discussed or, you know, sort of engaging with agro industry or at least that component of it that's relying on export markets as a path toward um, demonstrably uh, bringing more capacity to indigenous people too. Or is this, is this in the mix? This is an open I, reporter's question. <laughs> I just wanted to add, uh, to say something about it. I mean, um, I have um, um, seen or, or read about uh, some of these efforts in, in again, but uh, at a really small scale, I, I should say even you know, for Brazil. Um, but for instance, our data from RICE, the, the recent um, uh, deforestation analysis uh, is telling us that 84% of the deforestation that happened between 2000 and 2018 was due to uh, agriculture. So it is still an agriculture that is uh, being um, don't over, you know, uh, deforestation. Yeah. Any other quick thoughts? There, there are a couple more questions we can get to. Uh, uh, Philip Rothrock had another one um, for David. Uh, what practical message would you provide to Red, Red Plus project developers and voluntary standards developers? What would you say the baselines should be would you say the baselines should be forward-looking to more accurately account for risks? I, I would say that you need a, and I think Michael started to get at this, you need a parallel system. Um, there is no easy way to create a baseline about what's going to happen five or 10 years from now. Um, and what you really need to be doing is to be building something that's going to help conserve these forests five or 10 years from now. So I would be thinking, how do we pay people based either on carbon stocks or on hectareage or on the costs of forest governance? And I would get away from the whole additionality context, concept in this context of indigenous territories, Afro-descendant territories and community managed forests. That's an interesting point. So within RED, you're saying there's so much of a the, the, the whole structure really is inadequately designed to capture what you need to do here. The structure is inadequate for this type of situation. It's not necessarily inadequate for other types of situations. No, right, exactly. I think that's really important to think about. And this, you know, that just 
clearly says there's a lot of um, work to do to build that new structure, to build that new agreement or the like. Uh, there's This gets to all the uh, claims out there of here we are on Human Rights Day. I think it's the year of indigenous, is it the decade of indigenous peoples? That usually, the UN and others have made a point. They have agencies that are there designed to reflect um, fully integrating, more formally integrating indigenous uh, needs into sustainability concepts. It sounds like we have work to do. Uh, we're at the end of our technical time. I would love it if anyone has a final point they wanna make very briefly, uh, given what you've heard today uh, about the integration of data into decision-making about next steps. Uh, so anyone here is free to um, make a final point. Thank you all for being here today, Carmen, Veto, Juan, Oliver, and the rest. Anyone well, else? Andrew, um, this is Juan Carlos. Um, mm -hmm. If it is my final comment, um, I would like to really appreciate for this invitation and, and also to congratulate for this webinar to all of you and the speakers. Um, in my ex short experience in the international arenas and also now being on the ground with this uh, new problem of the pandemic, uh, COVID, we are being seen uh, directly and indirectly very sad uh, 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 news, right? I mean, very sad uh, actions and it's still going on and the, and the destruction every daily, daily, minute by minute, uh, all the forests that we as indigenous organizations, indigenous people, local communities, Afrodes, and we are defending. I just want to mention this because the agenda changed for everybody. Uh, some of the leaders there, they are not here. They, they died recently, some of the leaders, beyond uh, youth leaders and uh, elders leaders. And this is very sad. So it's time to... Uh, to invite to the international cooperation, uh, invite to all the partners to reanalyze and to be more human and sensitive uh, how, uh, how we, the next, uh, the, the life is giving a new opportunity. I mean, we are trying to do our best. We, we have our own problems, we have our own mistakes, but uh, uh, you're giving the chance to say my message is that I to commemorate everybody, to you, to my partner speakers, to uh, all the international cooperation, to trying to be more uh, 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 directly and for the people, uh, I mean, the civilization who are doing and doing their life to defend uh, with the water, forests and everything. Thank you very much and, and appreciate it. Thank you and thank everybody for watching today. I'm assuming that this uh, will be available um, on the website foresttrends.org, uh, forest-trends.org uh, sometime soon. This has been Free Riding and the Exclusion of Indigenous Territories from Red in the, Am and in, in the Amazon Thursday here on Human Rights Day. Uh, I hope all of those who are, have been watching today can get in touch and keep working on these issues going forward. Uh, and those who have been involved as participants in this webcast, uh, it's great to meet those who I don't know and let's keep at this uh, in every way possible. Thank you very much for being here today. And it will be on, uh, on our site, uh, little, uh, some remarks, uh, the bed, some of the highlights, as well as a link to the recording. So we will provide that. So everybody. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Andy and, and everyone. It's been a pleasure, really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Ateja. Thank you. It was fantastic. Yeah. Thank you. Ciao. Ciao.